Well, I finished Clemson College in 1951, and I was second lieutenant reserve officer and went immediately in the Air Force, stayed in the Air Force for 21 months to meet my obligation. Got out of the Air Force and stayed in reserve. And uh, then I decided to go back to school to try to see if I get my master's degree. I started my master's degree work and couldn't find a good topic, so I decided to go to work. And I went on down to Eglin Air Force Base in Florida, worked for Vitro Corporation of America for about three months there. Then later on, went back to grad school again, came back to Eglin again, and that was in, in June of 1956. And I was a weapons test engineer, and my job there was to try to look at the accessibility of weapon systems on aircraft. And then I heard about the ABMA operation coming up here in Huntsville, Alabama, so I decided I'd come up here and apply for a job. But being a civil, being a civil service employee, I just transferred up here. So I came up here in October 1956, and uh, my first job was with my boss was Hans Paul, one of the German Pinamonde group. And uh, Hans was a very good boss for me, and he was, he matter of fact, uh, he knew I was working on my master's degree, so he had, asked me to work on some cooling system designs, and I did that. And then I did a lot of work in flight evaluation also, trying to figure out what happened to vehicles when they flew. Over a period of time, I was able to uh, work a deal with, with Hans that I could go back to grad school. So he sent me back to grad school, and I did my thesis on boiling of liquid nitrogen. and. That was used in the cooling system on the Jupiter system. From the cooling system design, I wound up, like I said, doing a lot of uh, evaluation of missile flight tests on the Redstone and Jupiter, Ju Juno, uh, Juno 1. Didn't get to work on the Saturn 1 at all, but uh, did, a, did a systems analysis. Then I became a, a aerodynamics uh, research engineer, which were doing aerodynamic heating studies, measuring the temperatures of the various parts of the vehicle in, while during flight. And then later on, uh, uh, that was 1960, uh, February 1960, about 80% about of us, as well as I remember, transferred into Marshall Space Flight Center. And I was immediately transferred into the Air Ballistics Division there. And I was in the, in, in the technical and scientific staff on the, on the uh, Air Ballistics Division at, at Marshall here. And then over a period of time in that job, I wound up being a project engineer on the Atlas Centaur and the Atlas Agena. And that program, however, was transferred out at a period of time to Lewis Research Center. And so I did not want to go to Lewis Research Center. So I came back to Marshall and went back to my work in the air ballistics lab. And then I when I first got here in 56, uh, a friend of mine, both of us came up from Florida. And we decided we would uh, maybe go to work for ABMA. But we actually went to Tullahoma to see what they were doing up there. We came back to ABMA, but the problem in Huntsville in 1956, population was somewhere around, I think, 47,000 or something like that, and there were no places to stay. So all five of us guys got together and rented the ladies' living room for a few months until we could find a, a house. One of our guys actually built a duplex, and the rest of them moved in with him, and I moved into a separate place myself. And that's, that's all the way it was in Huntsville. It was just a just laid back town. It was just like it was. It, you know, Redstone Arsenal was bringing money. It was like, we always said it was a, a um, center of poverty and, and a center of prosperity because of the fact that the cotton fields here were not selling their cotton and, uh, they, and there was no interest in the area. And so Sparkman, Senator Sparkman really uh, was a trigger that put the Redstone Arsenal on the map. You gotta remember now, the average age for the engineer, as well as understand, was 24 to 27. Uh, most of us were just out of college, didn't have much of a, experience but here's the challenge we're going to do something in 10 months that's never been done before and so that was the thing about it. it was so interesting to be working in these challenging situations we didn't mind working 80 bucks 80 hours a week because we knew we were going to do something different and that was part of it. everybody had so much enthusiasm about it that that was the thing about von brown he created so much enthusiasm about let's get this job done and do be successful in it you know I wound up being a man for, for the operations of uh, developing design criteria for the uh, lunar rover. And so knowing nothing about the moon, I began to have to study a lot about the moon's surface, what I thought it might be like, and talk to the geologists to try to get some good feeling. And then we're able to get the surveyor spacecraft to land on the moon. 
And so we landed seven of those spacecraft on the moon, and they gave us a good idea of the soil characteristics as well as the debris around the landing sites. And we actually had one surveyor that bounced a couple of times, which gave us a good idea of the lunar surface operations. Then later on, uh, we got the orbiter program, and the orbiter program was an orbiting about 70 miles, 50 to 70 miles, I think, above the surface of the moon. And it gave us one meter resolution, or about three foot resolution, roughly of the, of the crater sizes, the number of craters or rocks around the craters, thing like that. So that was very useful for us to, as a design criteria point. And then we can later on decided, well, we know pretty much about what the surface characteristics are like because of the surveyor spacecrafts. So we'll develop some lunar simulated materials that we think would be a characteristic of the lunar surface operations. And if we get in the future to do some lunar mobility studies, we'll continue to maybe use that simulant as a, as, a, as a device for the wheel design. And so that's actually what happened. The lunar surface materials were created because we knew the particle size, roughly the particle size and things of that sort. And so we used that. The Waterways Experiment Station down in Mississippi had all these uh, test bins, and we had these big test bins full of uh, lunar soil simulate. And uh, Dr. Costas was one I worked with too. He also was a soil expert, expert, expert. And uh, so he and I together, we were authorized to form a panel called the Lunar Surface Travelability Panel. And I was co-chairman of that. And from that data, we, uh, we actually established what we felt like was a good design criteria model for the lunar surface. The, the, actually, the first, the first mission was we actually impacted the Ranger program on the moon. And that was mainly to just see if we could actually do it. First lunar impacts, we had five or six missiles which didn't work too well. We finally got one impact, and we get the pictures coming in the moon, but that didn't tell us too much. But it demonstrated we had the technology to, to drop something on the moon. And then the idea became, well, well, now let's go back and see if we can go to some site that's really interesting on the moon. And so that's why Surveyor 1 site was picked, mainly because there was nothing out there hardly in, in the area, and it was a very flat-looking area based on our orbit analysis. When we first started out, it was more important to, to be able to land on the surface. And so, but the Surveyor spacecraft told us a lot about the moon's surface, and we got some pretty good ideas of bearing strength and characteristics. And we never did believe, I never did believe the surface was going to be covered up in 10, 100 meters of dust. A lot of people did. A lot of people had that concept. But... Um, when this spacecraft bounced a couple of times, we realized that, well, at that, 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 that particular site, I wrote a paper in 1967 about going to a landed surveyor site to see if we could actually find pieces of the material and bring them back to Earth. Well, that was Surveyor 1 site, but my idea finally evolved in Apollo 12 where they actually went to a surveyor site and actually brought back parts of the spacecraft. And so I was really, really happy about that. It's, it's sort of funny, too. While I was working on uh, this program, trying to figure out, uh, Dr. Von Brown would come down every so often. I had a lot of photographs, and he would take a look at my photographs occasionally, and we'd talk about where to go on the moon. And that was, one, that was really interesting to meet the man and talk with him, and, and so that was one thing I really, one of my memories that I really enjoyed. Von Brown was very much a a people person. And most people don't realize that because being an aristocrat, being a German baron and stuff like that. But he realized that if you're going to get people to work for him, you got to let them think you're interested in, he, in you. And so that's the way he was. He might walk around in the lab and, and, and ask you what you're working on. And a lot of times, if you're working on some kind of engine part or something like that, he may know that part. And that was the funny part about it. There was a big decision between Marshall and Johnson who was going to control the program. <laughs> and NASA headquarters finally decided that Marshall would control the program. So the contract was issued in November 1969, for the, and Boeing General Motors was selected as a contractor. Because their wheel design looked like a better wheel design, plus the fact they could actually fold the vehicle up. And a lot of their studies... Uh, earlier because they were thinking about building a surveyor spacecraft with a small remote control rover on it for JPL. And so, but they didn't get the contract to build that. But they had the concept of how to fold the thing up. And this guy, Ference Pavlik, 
from General, from General Motors came in with his design, and he had a little small radio control model of a rover, which could actually be folded up, and he put it on the floor and drove it into Von Brown's office. And I've been told that Von Brown said, you know, we ought to go with you guys because you're further ahead than anybody else. But I don't know if that's true or not. Yeah, we had all kinds of designs. We had we had jumping designs. We had crawling designs. We had uh, wheel designs. That was that was something. That was the main that was the main concepts, and that, not way out. Uh, but but uh, the wheel seemed to be the way to go. We did a lot of studies early. Von Tiesenhaus and those guys did a lot of studies on on locomotion, lunar locomotions. And Brown Engineering here did a lot of studies, and the guys down in Hayes Aircraft did a lot of studies on the Brown. And finally. Uh, we, Marshall got some money to contract out to get industry to see if he could come up with some nice designs. And they came up with all kinds of designs. Uh, Grumman Aircraft had a, a funny looking wheel design. Uh, Bendix had another wheel design. Uh, Chrysler had a, almost like a track vehicle design. AC Delco came up with their wheel design. And it's ironic, the wheel design uh, comes from a guy in England in 1857 named Thomas Ricketts, and he actually was a guy that was building locomotive wheels. And he wanted to build a small cart or some kind of small transporter, and he came up with the idea of a metal elastic tire. We brought the wheel design back to America, and I say reinvented the wheel, because the problem was he didn't tell us how to make the tire. And the tire looked like some kind of a wire mesh material. So the engineers at General Motors designed they would have uh, 84 micron diameter wire size coated with tungsten, uh, uh, tungsten coated wire, and then we'd have to figure out how to make the mesh. Well, we couldn't figure out how to make the mesh, but we found, and General Motors actually found a basket weaver there. And that basket weaver actually, we built him a tray, they built him a tray, and he actually wove those tires. It takes about eight hours to make one tire. And it was a very flexible tire. We had no problem with the tires. With the lunar astronauts actually drove about 56 miles on the moon. If you take each of the missions, nine, the three different, 15, 16, and 17, and each mission had three different driving missions in it. If you take all total of those nine different missions, it's about 56 miles, about halfway to Birmingham. And then we built a driving simulator here, and we actually trained the astronauts to drive on the moon. And we cautioned them, don't go above 10 miles an hour, because if you do, you'll be off the ground 35% of the time. And well, we almost lost a couple of times because they got a little too fast, one too, but that was part of it. And that was one of my jobs also. I worked in the, uh, during the mission, Apollo 15, 16, 17, we worked here in, in Huntsville, and we actually uh, had the guys to photograph where they were so we could actually determine where they were on the moon surface. But General Motors and AC Delco delivered three flight vehicles for us uh, in 18 months. Actually, there were four flight vehicles, but the fourth one was going to be a spare vehicle. And they delivered, and then they delivered eight different vehicles total, four for flight and four for testing. Well, the big problem was how to select what kind of wheel design. That was one of the big problems. The second thing was how to provide uh, the motor system and its drive system. That was the second thing, the big, two of the biggest problems we had on it. Uh, as far as uh, thermal control, that was not, we knew how we could do that pretty well. As far as radiation damage of a particle, particular materials and, and equipment, we knew how to protect that pretty well. Uh, the biggest problem, biggest problem was the, the interaction between the soil and the wheel characteristics. And like I say, we did a lot of work at, at Waterways Experiment Station down in Mississippi. So we had a pretty good idea of how well the vehicle could perform on the moon. Yeah. It gave us a lot of pride in doing something. I mean, here we are, we're doing something, nobody's ever done it before. And, uh, and it was a sort of a national pride to be able to put those men on the moon. And it's ironic, when we put the men on the moon, we really didn't plan to do anything but put them on the moon. And, but after a while, they said, you know, well, we're going to the moon, why don't we do something when we get there? You know, uh, but I still consider the Apollo program almost like uh, Christopher Columbus. We came over, settled America, went home. We came over, went to the moon, didn't settle the moon, and went home. So I would love to see us go back and settle the moon and do some research on, on the actual lunar history. And that's, and that's a real problem is we don't, we don't know too much about the moon. We don't even really know how the moon formed exactly. There's a lot of theories on how the moon formed. And, uh, and we know we had a lot of volcanic activity on the moon. So uh, 
we, we need to go back and get go to some of those other sites and collect data from the other sites. Yeah. Well, one of my most favorite memories was, was when, when I began working on the lunar surface operation stuff, and, and I was asked to participate in the Apollo 8 launch as a member of the Scientific Advisory Committee on Apollo 8. And that was one of the biggest when I saw that. And then, I, and after that was, I got to work on the early, back in the old days, I got to work on the early Jupiter flight test programs, and that was sort of interesting. But being an Air Force officer myself, I was sort of surprised when I found out the first Air Force ballistic missiles were the Jupiter missiles. There were three squadrons here at Huntsville, trained here in Huntsville. Uh, I don't remember the numbers of the squadron, but they actually wound up in Italy and wound up in Turkey. And there was something like, I forget how many in Turkey, uh, Jupiter missile systems with Air Force insignias on them, and they were nuclear warhead armed and aimed for Moscow. And that was 1961. Well, the Soviets always had a good program as far as that goes, and they did, they did land the first uh, lunar cod on the moon. And that was the first electric car on the moon. And they did, but it didn't go very far on the moon. But, uh, and they got a lot of good photography of the lunar surface, but their photography was not what I call high resolution photography. I don't think they released their high resolution photography. That's the point. And they did land the spacecraft on the moon first, and that thing, and they also did did the backside photography of the moon also, high resolution photography of the backside of the moon. And then they also brought a sample back from the moon to the Earth, which we did which we did which we which we have never done before. But they did it, yeah. And then they tried to build their big booster, and, they, and it blew up and killed a lot of people, and that sort of killed their program for a while. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it was a space race in one sense of the word because we didn't know who was going to control space, and that was the point. And then when the ballistic missiles came into phase, that was a real problem. What do we do now? So we've got to build some kind of deterrent against that ballistic, their ballistic missiles. So that's really what happened. In the early days, uh, Von Braun uh, wanted to build a lunar base, and that was called, and he had a special program called Project Horizon, and, and that was to build a lunar base on the moon. And as the generals always said, the man that controls the high ground controls the battlefield. So the lunar surface was the high ground. But that base never got built, and uh, because the Army was developing a ballistic missile at that point, yeah.